Good evening. Atoms, molecules, scientific research on one side of the program, polls, politicians, and problems on the other. But here's Ted with a rundown. Today, the federal and provincial governments announced a new science and technology policy, but no extra money. Just how badly is Canada's scientific reputation suffering? Coming up with Webster, Dr. John Polanyi, winner of the Nobel Prize for his work on chemical bonding in atoms. Where did the Liberals stand on free trade and cruise missile tests? Monday's vote in the House of Commons left some wondering, with four Liberal MPs voting contrary to official party policy. Is dissension stirring amongst the Turner ranks again? Webster goes to the top and asks Liberal leader John Turner, MP for Vancouver Quadra. John, a uh, Mr. Turner. <laughs> The leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition in the House of Commons, I must be formal. You are accused on occasion of doublespeak. Now, let's have the doublespeak. Where do you stand on free trade? Tories are going hell-bent for leather, it would seem, to make an overall pact with no protection for weakened industries. Now, you've been difficult to understand in free trade. What is the Liberal policy on a potential overall free trade pact, perhaps by the end of the year, with the Americans to the South? Well, you know, Jack, we've just seen that motion that the government, uh, the Tory government has deposited in the House of Commons. There's going to be debate on free trade on Monday. Finally, after almost two years, we're going to have a debate on free trade. Where's our position? We look at that government resolution and they're no longer talking about free trade. There's no comprehensive free trade in that resolution. They're talking about negotiating a trading arrangement with the United States. I've said before, we don't know what is negotiable, what's not negotiable. What's on the table or not on the table? But you can give me your opinion on what's not negotiable. I'll tell you that I don't believe, I don't believe there's going to be a comprehensive free trade agreement with the United States. Does I, that mean you don't want one? Well, we wouldn't open the auto pact. We wouldn't dismantle our marketing uh, arrangements for agriculture, the Canadian Wheat Board, other marketing arrangements. We wouldn't dilute our cultural industries. We wouldn't dismantle our regional equality programs. And that means that uh, we would not contemplate an overall comprehensive free trade agreement with the United States. We've said that from the beginning. So it's a bisectoral, a sectoral agreement on free trade with all present Canadian protections in position. Well, uh, we'll have to see what the government brings down. Uh, we can't respond to an agreement that uh, we haven't been told about. We don't know whether the Prime Minister last night told the provinces, the provincial premiers, but uh, we're going into this debate with an amendment where we will state our position unanimously and fully, as I have on three occasions in the House of Commons and about three or four occasions here in British Columbia, including today before the Canadian. Well, I've got it clear now. You would not go for an overall blanket free trade, no protection for weakened industries, no protection for the auto pack, and no protection for regional programs. That is so. And okay. I've also said, Jack, that uh, this countervailing duty that the United States has under its uh, Trade Act of 1978, which allowed them, for instance, to countervail B.C. lumber going into the American market, unless there's some restriction on countervail, that unilateral ability of the United States to hammer our exports at will, then a an agreement with the United States wouldn't be worth the paper it's written on. And in one word, that 15% solution was bad. You know my view, uh, you and Jack Monroe may disagree with me, but I think it was a lousy deal for Canada and very badly negotiated. Now let's get over the other political embarrassment. The NDP put up a motion on cruise missiles and four of your people stabbed you in the back. Now, isn't there a party whip to make sure they vote with the leader? Well, it would... Was that a free vote for Liberals? It, it was not a free vote. It would have been preferable, and uh, we've had a very <laughs> vigorous caucus on it, Jack. Our position uh, is clear, and I, I announced it after our uh, November convention. We had a resolution in favor of bringing cruise missile testing to an end. We also had a resolution reaffirming Canada's commitment to our alliances, NATO and our alliances with the Americans on defense. And I said immediately after that convention, when some of your colleagues put the question to me, yes, we will interpret the cruise missile resolution within the overall context of our alliance commitments. We'll also include the nuclear free zone resolution within that uh, overall commitment. And what we did in the House of Commons in response to the NDP amendment, and by the way, the NDP uh, has no uh, love for NATO. They, they're still on record as uh, an isolationist, neutralist party. They don't support NATO. They don't support our alliance with the United States. We said we would agree 
to eliminating and terminating the cruise, uh, cruise missile testing uh, in a way that was compatible with our obligations under NATO and our other bilateral agreements. That means you're stuck with the agreements as long as you're in the agreement, doesn't it? No, what it means is that we have a right to unilaterally to terminate on, uh, on uh, 12 months notice. We would do it in a way that would enhance the overall movement towards peace. If the Americans agreed. Well, no. No, no, it would be our unilateral decision. Mm. But here we thought that just when the Soviet Union had come up with a new concrete offer mm -hmm. on arms control, and when we had for the first time in, uh, in, uh, in a long time a positive response from the United States, that for us, unilaterally to terminate might not be compatible with those negotiations. Mm -hmm. So we will terminate mm -hmm. at a time and in an opportunity that would help those negotiations and would help the overall movement to peace. Yeah, the NDP are really having a free one in this one, aren't you? But you must be very upset at the people who voted against it. I mean, because it does look like a knife in your back. Well, Tanner uh, doesn't know what he's talking about. The people well, of Canada I, uh, well, don't want the cruise missile. I, uh, caucus is the place where we handle those, uh, those discussions. And as I say, it was a pretty uh, vigorous caucus, caucus yesterday. You've handled that particularly vigorous caucus. Now, another little thing in which you've been accused of not supporting the West Coast, the International Financial Center of Vancouver. Now, I know it means only a few jobs, but it's something that we apparently want. Are you in favor of the International Financial Center for Vancouver? Well, Jack, I, on the steps of the legislature about three weeks ago when I called upon the Premier, Premier Van Der Zandt, I said that uh, I did not like federal legislation that was divisive, mm -hmm. that put city against city and province against province. That was not a role for a federal taxation measure or a federal banking measure. Uh, I said also, when we looked at the Ways and Means motion that set out this proposal mm -hmm. for an international banking uh, center, it was a sham. It was a fraud. It really didn't produce anything. As a matter of fact, Mel Cuvillier, the Minister of Finance for British Columbia, has made statements to the same effect. Gerard D. Levesque, the Minister of Finance for Quebec, has, has, has agreed with me. Now, In other words, it's, it's of no value to anyone. It merely upsets Toronto. Uh, well, it's divisive. It doesn't really mean anything. It's got certain cosmetic or symbolic value, I suppose. But I said to the Premier, I said, look, there are other ways, as a British Columbia member of Parliament, I can help you and help the province. I'm all behind you in getting the 5% up to 11% in federal procurement. Mm -hmm. We only get 5% of federal procurement in yeah. British Columbia, despite 11% of our population. I'll go to bat for you and have on the Polar 8 icebreaker. I'll go to bat for you on enhancing the Port of Vancouver, mm -hmm. enhancing our airport. Hansen the Science Center, the Triumph Project of the University of British Columbia. That is a legitimate role. But don't ask me to, uh, to sponsor uh, divisive legislation that uh, really doesn't enhance the national unity of the country. Just by the way, yesterday I had the waterfront unions on complaining very bitterly about the proposed amendment to the Green Transportation Act, which would in effect subsidize with Canadian taxpayers' money the shipment of grains and containers perhaps to the U.S. ports. Now, you're obvious. Do you know about this thing? I certainly do. I, uh, I was here in Vancouver three, four weeks ago speaking before the BC Chamber of Shipping. And I gave them my undertaking, Jack, uh, that I would uh, and our party would oppose that amendment. What it really does is allow grain producers on the prairies to get their money but move the, move the grain through Tacoma, through Bellingham, through Seattle. Through Portland. Through Portland at, at Vancouver's expense. Not only that. If we don't have the grain moving out of Vancouver, we don't get the return uh, trade. Container traffic. You got it. And uh, I think it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of, and uh, we're opposing it right to the limit. Do you think it's because the farmers in the prairies are fearful of labor disputes on, on the waterfront and that they want this escape valve to go elsewhere? That particular amendment uh, was snuck in um, uh, a little while ago by one of the Saskatchewan members uh, because of an own particular problem in his riding. But I don't, I have a feeling, frankly, Mm -hmm. uh, that the federal government really does, uh, doesn't understand the full repercussions of it. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that uh, when we bring this to Mr. Crosby's attention, the Minister of Transport, that we'll get, uh, get a, a positive response. But uh, I oppose that all the way. That is really stupid uh, legislation. God, I was the guy that asked you on national television where you were going to run this time. And I suggested Capilano and Uran and Quadra. Remember that? I remember, the convention? I remember Jack, yeah. Well, you gave up your apartment here. Will you run again in the next election in Quadra? I am going to run and win in the next election in Quadra. And let me, uh, you know, uh, the people of Canada uh, give me a place to live. Stornoway, 
as leader of the opposition. Oh, yeah. The people of Canada give the prime minister of our country a place to live, yeah. 24 Sussex. Mm -hmm. He doesn't uh, live in Manicouagan either. I'm out here, as you know, every three or four weeks. Oh, no, I'm not, no I, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't complaining about giving up your place yeah. to live. I was just going to make sure that you were still going to run in Vancouver. I'm going to run in Vancouver, and I just hope... Um, and obviously you'll walk away with it, won't you? Oh, you'll uh, walk away with the election. Well, your party's top of the polls. Jack, you know, the last election, I watched you on national television during the election, and boy, we were getting wiped out across the country. The Liberal Party was being wiped out. And you said, there goes Turner, he won't win Quadra. And I watched you. No, you'd had no faith in me, Jack. That the, and you had no faith in the people of Vancouver Quadra. Now, you know, I... I, I that mind you, I had interviewed you shortly before. Maybe that was the impression <laughs> you left with me. Oh, no, I told you we were going to win that. I told you that the people of Quadra were going to give me a chance. As a matter of fact, to be quite honest, I was the guy who used the line better to vote for the leader of a national party than have Bill Clark re-elected. Well, I told the people of Vancouver Quadra, I gave them one undertaking. They would hear from their member of parliament and they okay. would have a voice in Parliament, and, and they have. Well, the NDP will certainly have 100 seats in the next House with all the support they've got in Quebec, with Broadbent's personal popularity, with their high standing in the polls, the Tories down at 22, 24 percent undecided. You're going to have to... How many NDP seats in the next House? Don't count on it, Jack. Uh, we will be the progressive alternative in the next election. Your questions and calls to John Turner, leader of the Liberal Party in this country, after the break. The Shane inquiry into war criminals, Mr. Turner, seems to go for three things. One, there are some war criminals here. They want to uh, recommend extradition, changes in the criminal code, and to denaturalize them so that they can be sent back to whence they should be for trial. How do you stand on the Shane? Well, we, uh, we have accepted only one of those three recommendations of uh, Judge DeShane, and that's the one to broaden the scope of the criminal code to make uh, a war crime uh, uh, a prosecution under Canadian law. In this country? In this country. But no extradition? We haven't, uh, we haven't agreed to the extradition, we haven't agreed to the denaturalization. What, now, we, uh, what, our, you know, what our party is trying to do, and we took a fairly common view, frankly, with the government on this issue. What our party is trying to do, we're anxious to conclude the healing process by bringing war criminals to justice and to eliminate the uncertainty that uh, plagued this whole issue over a number of years. Now, uh, Vancouver Kingsway is going to be wiped out under redistribution. NDP seat owned by, uh, owned, occupied by Ian Waddell. Where do you stand on that one? Well, I've uh, told Ian and uh, said publicly uh, over the air and again today before the Canadian Club that uh, uh, I believe Vancouver should have the five seats and should not be cut down to four. Uh, I'm consulting our people here as to whether I should sign Ian's petition. Ian Waddell's position. He said he hands me this petition. It's signed by the whole NDP caucus from British Columbia, and I didn't know whether I wanted my signature with those with those people. Oh, uh, well, furthermore, they might have changed the top. Well, I made mean, it. Sand cruise I, missile I, I, signed I, I, by John Turner. Well, that's right. And I said to Ian, you know, I said we have a we have a principle in our party, and I, I like to read the thing before I sign it. Yeah. Uh, I haven't made up my mind whether to sign Ian's petition or whether to send in my own petition, but I. But I support what he's trying to achieve. I, I'm, I believe Vancouver should have five ridings. It would seem that about they... Oh, by the way, we haven't mentioned scandals. Not once have we mentioned any Tory scandals. Are they all now dead and buried, gone? Well, uh, I, uh, I'm glad we're getting back to, to other issues in the House of Commons because the scandals, although they affect the credibility of the government, mm -hmm. they haven't done any member of parliament any good. I think public cynicism has never been higher. Never been higher. And that does not contribute to the proper working of a democracy. So you're going to lay off the scandals if and until you get new ones? Jack, uh, we do have a role as members of the opposition to hold a government to account, to hold a government honest. Right. That is the job the Canadian people uh, gave us. You know, we didn't, uh, we didn't produce the scandals. You had some of your own in the past, of course. I mean, well, every government has scandals. We're all used to that. I don't think that uh, for a long time, if ever, any government has had uh, a general tone of, of ethic that uh, makes Canadians wonder just what kind of public administration we're getting. Now, what you're really saying to me, well, what about the Liberals? I said on your program that I don't have any monopoly on morality, and the Liberal Party has no <laughs> monopoly on morality, and uh, the whole atmosphere has hurt us all. 
Petro can. Do you yeah. think they're going to dump it? Well, it depends. How much is it? Five billion, six yeah. billion of our money in buying uh, that uh, thing? National energy policy it, and all uh, that jazz. It depends which minister you talk to. At the same time that the Minister of Finance, Michael Wilson, was telling a group in Calgary of oil people that uh, they were going to privatize uh, uh, Petro Canada because it, and sell it off because it no longer had any national right. policy, mm -hmm. you've got John Crosby. Uh, down in Newfoundland saying it did have a national policy role and uh, there it is. Our view is quite clear. We believe that because Canada has to remain self-sufficient mm -hmm. in oil and gas, because we're going to have to explore and develop offshore and in the north, that Petro-Canada has a policy role as an instrument of national policy. Good, keep it. Yes, sir. Go ahead to John Turner. Hello, Mr. Turner. How do you do? Oh, not fine today. I'd like to congratulate you on a job well done in, in rebuilding the Liberal Party in Western Canada as a credible alternative to the Tories. Where are you calling from? Uh, Burnaby or uh, Burnaby. Vancouver. Yeah. And I would like to ask you, first of all, if you form the next government, will you repeal the massive tax increases that the Tories have brought in in the last two years? And if you do form this government and you do reduce these, take back these tax increases, how will you, as the Liberal Party, um, re reduce the federal deficit? Well, we're going to move towards tax reform no matter what the Conservative government does. And uh, I said today in Vancouver that uh, I am very, very concerned about the three budgets that the Mulroney government has brought in. If you look at those three budgets and analyze the effect on taxpayers, bring in the personal sur surtax on personal income tax, the excise tax increases, the sales tax increases, the de-indexation of the system, over the four years of the Mulroney government, as a result of those three budgets, if you earn $15,000 a year, your total cumulative tax increase is 52%. If you earn $100,000 a year, that increase in tax over four years is only 4%. That is not fair. That widens the gap between the rich and poor in this country. We would reverse that trend, I can guarantee you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Turner. Good afternoon. I have uh, two quick questions. One is on, uh, I'd like to know the Liberal position on uh, R&D in Canada, which is now becoming a major issue and how free trade would affect that. Right now, we're the lowest uh, in R&D in the Western industrialized nations. We, uh, we're a branch plant economy. What happens there is that the home office in the United States mm -hmm. centralizes all their R&D down there, and I think free trade will really affect that. And my second question is one on the SRTCs, which was brought in by the Liberals. Right now, there's massive fraud being showing up on that program, but what's happening is the government is approaching this they're not charging these people under the, they're charging them under the tax act, but they're not going after these people under the criminal code for fraud. And they can't bring them back from the states. Well, if, uh, you know, I, uh, I think you've got to examine every individual case, and I can't make judgments on individual taxpayers. Well, we're all agreed there was $3 billion down the drain on the SRTC uh, thing. It turned into a scam, unfortunately, mm, Jack. Right. Uh, but it was being used within the law, within the Income Tax Act, which is why, perhaps, there aren't any criminal prosecutions. On R&D, uh, generally, uh, I think you're going to have a great authority on this program uh, when I get off it. Dr. John Polanyi, uh, our Nobel Prize winner, will be able to talk to you authoritatively about it. But I want to say that I've always looked upon education, research, apprenticeship, uh, training as not a cost of government but an investment in the intellectual capital of the country. And we in British Columbia are not going to be able to diversify our economy to compete in a tough world unless we focus on education and research. We're just not going to be able to do it. Go ahead, please. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Um, Mr. Turner, I, uh, I grew up in St. Andrews by the Sea, uh, New Brunswick, which I think you're familiar with the area. Um, and my question is about the Starkist tuna plant company that's there. Um, what is your opposition role and what pressure are you going to put on the government to get that plant open again? and to get 300 or 400 people back to work. It's a Sorry, city and... Uh, yeah, our, uh, our people, uh, our caucus, met with the, the workers from St. Andrews uh, uh, a week or so ago and uh, 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 then took them in to meet uh, Tom Sidden, the Minister of Fisheries. The Minister takes the position, of course, that he cannot overrule the inspectors in his own department. And I suppose I can't quarrel with that because that was the original issue that uh, got a former minister into, into some trouble. Uh, we have raised the issue in the House of Commons and we are uh, backing uh, the Minister of Fisheries in this particular case and trying to persuade the Heinz Company to reopen that plant. Go ahead, please. Good evening. Um, Mr. Turner, I find that your comment of the Liberals being the progressive alternative 
is a bit of a joke when you support the uh, testing of the cruise missile, which is uh, an off offensive weapon. Um, but what I'm wondering uh, what the liberals are doing with regard to something else, and this is touching on scandals or something that I see as scandalous, and that is the the uh, Conservative Party's um, new policy with regard to refugees. I, I think it's it's tragic that they're forced uh, to come up from countries such as El Salvador and Chile, which uh, some Canadian firms, I understand, have sent military equipment. Anyway, you object to this new policy of holding them up and lining them up at the border. Is that Absolutely. right? What do you say? Well, just to, uh, to, to, to uh, respond first to the remark about the cruise missile testing, we uh, believe that that testing should come to an end, but at a time and in a way compatible with our international obligations. Our, our difference with the NDP is, is that we believe in our alliances, and the NDP, of course, officially does well, not. What about the refugees? Despite all the comments you hear, there is a basic underlying bit of a backlash in this country uh, to the Americans kicking people out, and instead of letting them all in, we are holding them back at the border to judge whether or not they are economic migrants or refugees. No, no. Now, surely the government's move was a sensible move in the circumstances. Uh, Jack, we want to assure ourselves, I'm talking now about the Liberal opposition, that this country remains open to any legitimate, refugee. genuine refugee. We, when there is political, uh, problems in a home country or uh, terrorism, whatever. I mean, we are sure. we should hold ourselves open as as human beings to receive these people. But are, are we being but, faced with economic migrants but being if, squeezed out of the states? But if we are being exploited, if uh, if uh, the legitimacy of the refugee flow into Canada is being tainted mm -hmm. by any way, then we've got to ensure ourselves that the regular flow of immigration. So you approve of what the, what the Tories did? Uh, we think they've done it in the wrong way, uh, but we think that uh, there has to be some reconciliation. How else could they do it? Well, I think, uh, first of all, they, you know, they didn't follow the, the, the Plout Report recommendations. They've, uh, they, they've sowed confusion in the way the matter is being handled at our uh, border points. Uh, and uh, our, our uh, critique, uh, uh, Sergio Marchi, who's going to be out with me here today, uh, tomorrow in Vancouver. He's going to be on here tomorrow night. He's going to be on here? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Sergio will set it right forth, but we're meeting uh, all our uh, cultural communities in Vancouver tomorrow mm -hmm. on this and other issues. Because there, there, there must come a limit in a time of uh, economic travail, said he, speaking reasonably, he hopes, that we must, to some extent, control the border. Well, we've we can't got, just open it wide and let everybody come in. We have, we? we have an immigration law. We have people uh, seeking entry into Canada, want to be reunited with their families mm -hmm. in Canada, and we've got to ensure that the credibility of that process is maintained and not overrun by... Cure jumpers. That's right. After the break. <laughs> Go ahead to John Turner. Yes, Mr. Turner. I'm a young farmer from Alberta just visiting my brother right now, and I really take exception to your defending the West Coast um, longshoremen who feel that their jobs are threatened by this grain handling. As a Western farmer, my prices have gone down by more than 60% over, over the last four years. No, no, and, no. and I, can't, I just really cannot afford any more delays in my shipments of grain. And the cost of shipping grain through Canada is about 30% more than shipping it through the, through the states. When I go to my elevator, I get the price of my wheat, but it's not the world price. It's the price I get with my wheat after it's shipped to port, uh, after it's uh, taken to the nearest port. And if my costs, I can save 30% by going through the states, why do I have to go through Canada? Just a minute, does he save 30%? I, I thought we subsidized the freight costs by about 80%. On the shipments to whatever they're going for export. That's right. I uh, I can't agree with that, that that proposition. It doesn't make any sense to me that uh, grain moving out of Alberta or Saskatchewan or through the West Coast ports shouldn't be put through Canadian ports at no no uh, disadvantage to the the prairie farmer. And by the way, 
I'm going to be in Calgary on, on, on uh, Saturday talking about the farm problem again. I think we've got a, a crisis, as you know, in the whole agricultural economy of Western Canada. Nobody has said, Mr. Tunnel, as far as I know, that the reason of lifting, redefining definition of export to send subsidized freight costs to the American ports, that it's because of labor trouble on the West Coast. No, and I, uh, uh, you know, I believe that the, the port and the federal government have the duty to maintain that uh, uh, that working well, through the back. Yes, but no, no, that's not the reason. I think I think it was a slip up on the part of the federal government, and it's one that I oppose. And uh, I don't want to see uh, the port of Vancouver or the ports of British Columbia prejudiced on a Canadian subsidy, which allows Canadian grain to move through American ports. Fair enough. Go ahead from where is it in the Yukon? Whitehorse. Whitehorse, go ahead, please. Yes, I have a question for uh, Mr. Turner. Um, for us in the Yukon with the by-election coming up, a major issue is uh, the question of credibility and, and accountability. And with the Liberal Party having adopted uh, a policy uh, opposed to cruise missile testing, um, I was wondering um, how Mr. Turner can assure the Canadian people that if we elect him as the next government, uh, if he won't listen to his own party, what chance do we have of him listening to the Canadian people? I don't really know what you're getting at. What we've said is that uh, we want to bring cruise missile testing to an end, but uh, in a way and at a time that's compatible with our obligations with our treaty partners. I think that's, that's clear. Up in uh, Whitehorse, uh, we're having a nomination, I think, this Saturday as to who is going to be our candidate in that election, and I'm going to be up there, uh, I, th I hope, at least at the end of June to, to help that candidate. Well, is cruise missile such a big issue? Of course, in the Yukon it is, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is, because we're quite closely affected by it. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My call is in reference to research and development also. Um, even though the SRTCs had failed because of the abuse, we're wondering if a modified system to take out that abuse will be brought back. Well, uh, I consider research and, and development as, as not a cost to the country, but investment capital in the future of the country. And we certainly have to uh, look at ways in uh, fulfilling that commitment. If this country uh, does not work smarter, think smarter, and uh, learn smarter, we're not going to be able to compete with the world. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Turner, I'd like to congratulate you on uh, the way you brought our party back together. I'm a liberal member and have been since, oh, since I was of voting age and when it was very dangerous to be a liberal out here. Um, <laughs> the, only, uh, the, only, uh, the only thing that was protecting the Liberal Party uh, in Western Canada for the last 20 years were the game laws. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, I have to differ with you on the uh, cruise missile policy. Uh, I don't believe that it's a good idea that we allow the Americans to continue to test and that we just sign this treaty to allow them to do it for, what, five more years without any public consultation or anything. I think, uh, as a Liberal member, that uh, that is a loser. Uh, we don't, we should not support the Americans running roughshod over our, uh, over our Arctic with their cruise missiles. Well, we have mutual uh, defense obligations with the United States. I do agree with one remark you've just made, however. That is to say, before the government of Canada reviewed or renewed that five-year agreement with the United States, it should have been brought before Parliament. It was not. It should have. You're Go right. ahead, please. Good evening, Mr. Turner. Good evening. Mr. Turner, I read in the province newspaper Tuesday morning, I think it was, that Canada is now the number one major supplier of oil to the U.S. 770-odd thousand barrels a day. Venezuela has dropped to number two. Could you please tell myself and the audience listening why in the U.S. of A, they can buy gasoline from, US, from Canadian oil at 87 to a dollar a gallon, and we have paid... 45 cents a litre in Canada? That is a very, very good question. And uh, that brings up Petro Canada again. Um, the four major multinationals, if you want to call them, uh, are not, in my view, uh, passing along the full reduction of the world oil price to Canadian consumers. Petro Canada is right out there, front, front and center. At the same time, they are not paying to our own independent producers the North American price, so that our Canadian producers are not getting the North American price from the major four, and the major four are not passing on the world price. But is it not a consumers? fact that much of our ga retail gasoline price is composed of provincial and federal taxes for our social safety nets? There is a lot of tax. I mean, uh, if we, in the States, there are 37 million who don't have Medicare. 
Well, now, if they were to tax the gas to pay for Medicaid, it would go up 50 cents a gallon. Well, you know, uh, there's also a very competitive fabric in the United States that puts competitive pressure to, to follow those world prices down faster than that happens in Canada. Now, you talk about excise tax. You're perfectly right there, Jack. I mentioned in Parliament that with this additional one cent a litre, uh, the total increase now since the Conservatives came back into power is four cents a litre, or about 18 cents a gallon. And I looked over to John Crosby, the uh, mm -hmm. former Minister of Finance, who got thrown out on 18 cents a gallon and said, you know, John, it took you a long time to get that 18 cents back. But these gas increases, uh, uh, or tax increases, are certainly adding to the problem. Well, and the polls are still high on the hog. The only problem is that uh, the NDP broadband is more popular than you. What do you think it is? Well... Do you think he's smoother? Well, you know, uh, I think it's taking a little time to um, erase... Uh, an unfortunate image in that 84 election. I think we're climbing back fast. I'll say something else to you, Jack. When somebody says they're voting NDP in the next election to a Gallup poll or they're voting Liberal in the next election, they factor the leader into that result. And that's the only result that counts. Yeah, and Who only, do you vote for? And the only thing you'd agreed with Broadbent on is that the Tories are bound to go down the tube. Well, uh, I can understand why the Canadian people aren't very happy with their government. At My the thanks to John Turner. Next, the first for the Webster program. A Nobel Prize winning scientist, Dr. John Polanyi, after the break. <laughs> Dr. John Polanyi was the joint winner with two, North American, two other North American scientists of the 1986 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. And you're the first Nobel Prize winner I've ever met or uh, shaken hands with, so thank you very much for being here. But first, a very simple question. What did you win it for? <laughs> <laughs> I hope the answer is as simple as no, the question. No, don't need to be too simple. Don't need, don't need to make it too simple. Well, I won it for... Uh, slowly over about 30 years grinding my way to a conclusion about the motions of atoms and molecules as they are involved in a chemical reaction. As an old chemical bond is breaking, a new chemical bond is forming, <coughs> and stuff that previously was in the vat has changed into something else, one is entitled to ask, and I think it's sensible to ask, what are those atoms and molecules actually doing? If you saw them in a movie, what would they be doing? And we asked that question, and we measured a uh, feeble infrared emission from those reactions, and that gave us the clue in part as to what they were doing. So what you've done is you studied the atoms and the molecules, molecules and their change in construction, which had not been suspected before. Well, it was certainly known that they were doing something which, uh, as I say, broke an old bond, formed a new one. but. Um, what we actually did, to be more specific, was that the molecule which had just been born in the chemical reaction must be moving in some way, a way which reflects the sort of pummeling it's just gone on uh, through in this traumatic moment of giving birth. And if the molecule is zipping to and fro like that, vibrating, the result is going to be that infrared rays come out, and we measured those rays. And if it's tumbling head over heels, a different wavelength's going to come out, and we measured that. And so in the end, we were able to build up a, an approximate uh, movie, really, and we even made a movie, showing these atoms and molecules. Why do I think of chemical lasers and bombs in Star Wars? Well, it's interesting that you do. I mean, you're quite right that science has produced uh, lots of uh, new and frightening military devices, and particularly in this century, and, and the particular science that I was involved in was no exception. I mean, when we started, the big trick was to see this miserable little bit of infrared that was being given out. And then uh, in a few years, uh, it's very much the sorcerer's apprentice situation, this was the most powerful source of infrared rays. And so people thought, what can we burn? And one of the things they wanted to burn was incoming enemy missiles. Can the Polan Polanyi research be used in the Star Wars technology? And what would this do to you, a man who has written a book on the dangers of nuclear war? Well, I mean, just uh, would confirm my fears that one has to watch the applications of science closely. And, and it did confirm my fears. And uh, yes, it could be used. Uh, this uh, particular scenario, the Star Wars or SDI uh, scenario, is quite uh, 
loony in my view, but uh, it involves uh, bringing to bear uh, whole textbooks of physics, including this particular stunt. But the nightmare of a distinguished scientist su such as yourself must be that you'll make a discovery that can make the future of the mankind intolerable if it's wrongly used. Same with genetics. Is, it, yes. is that not a fact? No, that's true. I mean, what, what you're really saying is that new ideas, which are the currency that, that people like me work in, new generalizations about nature, lead to, if they are really new, they lead to powerful new devices, and those can be used for good or ill, and you have, uh, I suppose, two broad options. One is to stop science, which is practically saying, it's too dangerous to think, let's stop thinking, which I think is nonsense and, and degrading. But having, having made or, the discovery, or whatever, yes. there must be some non-scientific control over the uses. That's right, but I mean, not just non-scientific, but the scientists who uh, were involved in that work or can understand it have an obligation to uh, uh, make their uh, mm -hmm. opinions heard about the applications. Next question. Where does Canada stand today in its support for scientific research? Where do we stand today? For instance, is the state of affairs in Canada such that you would come to Canada as a young scientist, as the place where scientific research is really encouraged and developed? Would you come to well, Canada? No, I wouldn't today. I mean, when I came, uh, the air was full of hope, and, and it was a justified hope, because a little after that, uh, funding for basic science was very strong. This was about 15 years ago. It was really very strong, and good science was being done. And uh, unfortunately, that's been allowed to unravel. And uh, at the moment, for uh, an industrialized, prosperous country in the late 20th century, our uh, support of science and therefore our achievements in science are not at all what they should be and uh, people uh, in the scientific community know that and they It means therefore that our Canada. brightest young scientists will go elsewhere to study. Very few leave but those few who leave are the best. That's how the market operates. Those are the ones who are... Now this very off. day the Minister of Science and Technology has issued this fancy document National science and technology policy. Does that correct or seem to correct the weaknesses you fear in our research and our research and scientific research? Well, it's it's a hopeful sign of the times that that fancy documents are appearing and that the ministers of science from across the whole country are meeting and uh, trying to forge some agreed statement. So, you know, as a symbol of the times, it's, uh, it's mildly cheering. The actual content of the document, I, I've looked at it briefly, it's only just appeared, and uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, I sense the, uh, the usual uh, weaknesses, uh, you know, from my standpoint. Heavy on words and short on money. Well, I'd put it a bit differently. Uh, what I see there is a, a appeal that we've got to harness uh, Canadian science to applications, and that's a very sensible thing to do. I mean, we want applications, beneficent ones. But uh, apart from harnessing Canadian science, we have to strengthen it. You can't uh, put this mighty harness on a poor uh, You need more than just the brain. Creature. You need the research equipment and the material and to right. attract the best, the cream of the crop yes. from all over the world. I don't see that being said there, and I think it needs to be said. Now, I got some questions in R&D before, and I hope I get some questions to you now. What was the name of the book you wrote on the nuclear the war? The Dangers of Nuclear War. How long ago? Oh, I can't remember, six or seven years ago. And just to contradict the man who might be the Prime Minister of Canada one of these years, I'm not touting him in any way, shape or form, should we ban withdrawal from cruise missile testing under our defence agreements with the United States? You're asking me, yes. yes, and I won't be Prime Minister of Canada, thank God. But no, the, uh, I yes, I understand everything you said. Um, I would say that the, this is the moment to say to the United States that if they uh, persist in, in what I think is a poorly thought out, in fact a reckless uh, notion of unraveling the 1972 ABM treaty, then uh, we really should make a gesture and say we cannot go on with the cruise missile tests. I think that uh, one should say that just as a symbol of our uh, uh, anguish over this particular event, because that's a very important arms control agreement. and, uh, and People in the White House who are very powerful at the moment seem to be playing very carelessly with it. Questions to Dr. John Pogliani, winner of the 1986 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. Originally from England, but living yes. all your life in Ottawa, more or less. 
Well, in Toronto, most of it. Yeah, Toronto. I mean, recently. Yeah. After the break. <laughs> Are you finished the work with these two, your two colleagues in this one? Are you on a new research project now? Of I am. I, I'm not finished with those chaps. They're friends of mine. And you all work <laughs> together as a team? No, we didn't. No, it's typical of science. Uh, three people uh, working, actually they have collaborated at one time, but I've never collaborated with either of them, but there's a confluence of interests because there's the logic of science propels you to the same point. In other words, because of this logic of science, uh, Three mad scientists on mountaintop somewhere could each come to the same incredible discovery which could enable them to put off everybody else's hate bombs. That's a big mouthful, yes. But you know <laughs> what I mean? I'm saying three <laughs> different scientists in, diff in the same yes. field can come up with the same discovery. Well, the first part, leaving off the H bombs yes, for yes, another that question. Was silly. That was silly. The, the first part I agree with, and it happens all the time. And, and it just is a very interesting and important fact that science has a structure. And, and you ignore that at your peril. If you try and direct science along directions it doesn't want to go, you'll produce a mess. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, a two-part question, Jack. Yes. It's uh, to do with uh, the American involvement with the uh, five um, air bases up north to do with the Arctic, and uh, to what advantage does that give the Americans over us with the free trade policy? Oh, I don't think that's... Too hard for me. Too hard for me, too. The five air bases up north, well, we're deeply in, in de entangled with the Americans on international agreements. Obviously, if we started breaking off all our commitments to the Americans, signed the proper form and dignity, they'd be using the hammer on something else. But I don't think we can pursue that as a question for me or Dr. John Paul Anya. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello. Yes. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you think that the uh, Star Wars research or maybe your uh, area of research could be used uh, <coughs> beneficially for an inexpensive means of transmission of electricity instead of, say, the long high tension lines and things we have now, something along the lines of, say, Tesla was working on? Thank you. Well, the uh, answer to the technicality is that I don't know. Uh, but if you are looking for civilian uh, spin-off, Yes. then don't uh, spend uh, billions and billions of dollars uh, under another heading. It's the most wasteful way of pr producing Teflon-coated frying pans. I'm not accusing you of wanting to do so, but uh, there are people who are hearing that there are spin-offs from this sort of uh, SDI research uh, take great comfort from it, and I don't because uh, it's uh, provocative, as uh, you may or may not agree. It's going to escalate the arms race, and it's a silly way of getting technological benefits. Except that I presume that some of the spin-offs from your research, too, do become a question of R&D for specific industries. Oh, yes. You see, my research isn't under the heading of some particular application. No, no. It's under the heading of let's learn about nature and let's learn as much as we can, as fast as we can, and as cheaply as we can, and then let's see what we can do with it uh, when we have it. Go ahead, please. Yes, good evening, gentlemen. Um, my question concerns um, the human civilization, which seems to be uh, in a great contradiction and out of balance with the natural environment on the Earth. Um, and I, there's numerous examples, which I'm sure you don't want me to go into, or we can see this. Just one is the ozone layer. I'm just curious uh, what the doctor would feel about uh, uh, how he sees the role of scientists in bringing this to the public, such as I'm thinking of uh, the Physicians for Social Responsibility who have uh, taken up the cause of nuclear weapons. Does he see something similar in the, in the environmental area for uh, scientists? Yes, I certainly do, and, uh, and really for quite a broad range of scientists. Uh, not every scientist can get involved in every topic, but there is a sort of literacy that scientists have. I, I mean, it's really that they are numerate. Uh, they can not only read, but they can add and subtract. And uh, if you have that education, then it uh, really imposes an obligation on you to get involved in these slightly more technical debates. Uh, go ahead. That's please. a very real obligation. Sorry, go ahead, please. Yes, good evening, Dr. Polanyi. I was just wondering um, what you think, how you think uh, Canada stands right now as far as young scientists goes. I'm in, presently in grade 10 and I am interested in sciences. And I was just wondering if you could recommend what a young scientist, um, well, inspiring young scientist should do at this present time. 
Well, at first you seem to be asking about the prospects for uh, having a healthy scientific scene in Canada. I think grade 10 is just right. I mean, <laughs> uh, the, uh, there is a sense that I get in this country that people realize that uh, you may have heard uh, Mr. Turner saying this, in fact. They realize that uh, resources uh, can't be relied on to produce prosperity for all time, and in fact, not for very long. And uh, this then uh, puts us under pressure to use our wits. And so I think science will be built up in this country, and it's a lovely country, and if it uh, wants to do science as well, it couldn't be beaten as a place to make your career. If you're asking me to tell you where are the exciting areas mm -hmm. in science, uh, I'm diffident about that, but uh, if I were starting again, I wouldn't start in physical chemistry, though my friends will hate me for saying that. I will start in a biological area and uh, nearer to living systems because that's very exciting and we can handle it now. Good. You're talking about genetic research? Yes. That always frightens me a little bit, so start cloning us one of these days. Well, I'd it? like to comment on that, if, if, if yeah. I may. I mean, you know, the... Uh, people who are meeting here today, the science ministers, what they are agonizing about is here are long hairs like myself who are doing research and the research is ivory tower stuff and it doesn't produce any applications at all. You know, it's just an entertainment for professors. And by contrast, here are you worrying that every time we go into our lab we come out with some ghastly thing, you know, genetic engineering and hydrogen bombs and so on. You're much closer to the truth. The fact is that new ideas are very powerful and they can be applied, not just, of course, to military purposes, but to civil purposes. And so the science ministers, I think, should stop worrying about how to guide science uh, mm -hmm. to producing some applications. It'll produce applications, mm -hmm. but then we have to pick the right I ones. I think most of the public, perhaps my generation, will get a little bit odd, A-W-E-D yes. as well as O-D-D, -D, yes. when we think of what people are doing in laboratories, you know? Well, it's, oh, it is very powerful what can be done. I, I remember too in the famous Los Alamos there was a lot of dis discontent among the scientists about how far they should go in the development of the H bomb. They were right. I mean, that was a terrifying development. Right, and we'd better be Time terrified. for one short call. One short call. Yes, hello, Jack. Yes. A uh, quick one for Dr. Polanyi. Uh, where, who does he think should be making the decision of where the money is to be spent on pure research? And what areas of pure research would... Okay, we've only got a second. Right. Well, the answer is that the purpose of pure research is to make discoveries, and the only people who know where the discoveries can be made are scientists. My thanks to Dr. John Paul Agnier, Nobel Prize-winning Canadian chemist, 1986. Thank you, Doc. After the break. Tomorrow, Alan Gottlieb, our ambassador to the United States, Frank Oberle, and Sergio Macchi. Quite a collection for tomorrow night on Webster at 5 p.m. precisely.